Hello, everyone. I'm Augie Napoli, President and CEO of the United Way of Greater Cleveland. I'm Danielle Sidnor, President of the Cleveland branch of the NAACP. Together, we are honored to present to the community this series of community conversations on the Cleveland Consent Decree. Each session will focus on an area of the consent decree and police reform through a conversation among experts and community leaders to provide insight and to re-engage the community. The objective of these conversations is to provide a forum to raise awareness and increase community engagement on the consent decree and how it affects members of our community. The United Way's mission is being a voice for those in need. We know that there are so many underlying aspects of poverty which are hard to see and equally hard to discuss and solve. And certainly systemic racism is a main contributor to generational poverty that has afflicted our community for far too long. Not one organization can solve inequity and I am humbled to be only a small part of a group of esteemed community leaders from whom you will have the privilege to hear in this series. For 108 years, the Cleveland branch of the NAACP has worked to improve the political, educational, social, and economic status of minority groups, to eliminate racial prejudice, and to keep the public aware of the adverse effects of racial discrimination, and to take lawful action to secure its elimination. This community conversation and the monthly topics we will address related to the Cleveland Consent Decree are right in line with the work our organization has addressed and championed every day for over a century right here in Cleveland. Through this series, you will hear about the current status of the Cleveland Consent Decree and the future of policing in the city. And as the name of this event suggests, this is a two-way dialogue, and we want to hear from you tonight and every month in this series as we tackle these various topics. I'd like to thank Cuyahoga Community College and Rockwell Automation for sponsoring and making this series possible. I would also like to thank the City Club of Cleveland for partnering with us in hosting the series of events, and WOVU for simulcasting this evening's discussion live on 95.9 FM. We'd also like to thank all of our community partners. Good evening, my name is Danielle Sidnor, and tonight's topic is community engagement, recruitment, and diversity. The consent decree mandates the City of Cleveland Division of Police maintain a high level of quality service, ensure safety, ensure officer safety and accountability, and promote constitutional effective policing by reviewing and revising as necessary its recruitment and hiring program to ensure that it successfully attracts and hires a diverse group of qualified individuals. In developing and implementing its recruitment plan, the Cleveland Division of Police will consult with the Community Police Commission and other community stakeholders on strategies to attract a diverse pool of applicants. Tonight's conversation will review what has been done to accomplish this objective and what work remains to build trust within our community. Tonight's moderator is Darielle Snipes. Darielle Snipes serves the Cleveland Metropolitan School District CMSD News Bureau as a field reporter and anchor for CMSD TV. You might not have known we have a TV station in our school district. She covers CMSD news and activities for broadcasts on both cable and web outlets and supports departments and schools with videos and messaging for CMSD TV broadcasts. I am honored to introduce tonight's conversation moderator, Darielle Snipes. 
Thank you so much, Danielle and Augie, for that introduction. Introduction, And thank you to the United Way of Greater Cleveland and the Cleveland branch of the NAACP for inviting me to moderate this critical discussion. And thank you to the City Club of Cleveland for hosting this series of events and WOVU for simulcasting this evening's discussion live on 95.9 FM, WOIO Channel 19 and WKYC Channel 3 will also be live streaming this discussion. So that's everyone understands how we'll interact this evening. This is a community conversation. We will begin with questions that I prepared for this evening's conversation. And again, it is a conversation. There will be public questions and answer segment at approximately 7 p.m. when questions from the community will be heard and shared with our panel. You can start asking those questions right now at any time during this evening's program, and we'll make sure to attempt to get to all the questions before the event is up at 7.30. So you can text your questions to 216-307-5632. Again, that number is 216-307-5632. I'll be saying the number throughout the conversation. So if you missed it, I will definitely say it again. So don't worry. And at this time, I would like to introduce our panel of experts for this evening. First, we have Detective Felton Collier. Detective Felton Collier started with the Cleveland Division of Police in 2008. Upon graduation from the Police Academy, Detective Collier um, was assigned to the 5th District. Detective, I'm sorry, Collier, not Collier, Collier is a part of the public safety recruitment team where he assists with the recruitment of all of the city's public safety careers. Kareem Hinton, Kareem Hinton is the founder and member of Black Lives Matter Cleveland and a bail advocate in Cleveland, Ohio, where he serves the community. Kareem was compelled to be an advocate after high profile shootings by Cleveland police and comes to activism and the bail reform movement after working hard toward police reform. Michelle Heyer has been an assistant U.S. attorney since 2003. She focuses on civil rights enforcement, including the ADA, the Fair Housing Act, and constitutional policing. Prior to that, she was a trial attorney for the Department of Justice's Office of Special Investigation. Director Carrie Howard currently serves as the safety director of the city of Cleveland's Department of Public Safety. Prior to becoming director, he served as the department's assistant director of safety operations. Earl Ingram serves as the club director for the St. Luke's Manor Boys and Girls Club. Since 2014, Earl has been blessed to work with a multitude of amazing young leaders from all over Cleveland who is proud to stand alongside every day. Earl's passion centers around creating authentic spaces for youth to be heard and seen as equal partners. Earl is also joined by two students from the Boys and Girls Club, Caleb Carmen and Ryan Greer, who will ask two questions during the question and answer segment. I'm looking forward to their questions. Victor Ruiz is the executive director of Esperanza in Cleveland, where he has overseen substantial growth and partnerships across the Cleveland community to spearhead major community initiatives. Mr. Ruiz was a member of the selection panel for the Community Police Commission, which the Cleveland Consent Decree established. He is also a member of the Cleveland Police Monitoring Team. Commander Johnny Johnson. Commander Johnson is over the Cleveland Division of Police's Bureau of Community Relations. Commander Johnson created the Community and Problem-Oriented Policing Plan and Neighborhood District Policing Committee Enhancement Strategy. He also helped create the Community Engagement and Problem Solving and Managing Community and Problem-Oriented Policing Activities for Superiors Training Curriculums. Also tonight, Alicia Ellis will present the community questions. Ms. Ellis is the founder and creator of the multimedia platform Mas Lare, and she is also co-founder of the women's empowerment group Fierce Women on Board. Well, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to have what I hope is a very interesting and productive conversation. And I would like to start um, this evening with talking about some of the things that have happened in the last couple of weeks and, and within the last week before we really get into the nuts and bolts of community engagement, recruitment, and diversity. Um, the first thing I would like to, to talk about is issue 24. Um, as you all know, last week, the 
People went to the polls and 59% of Cleveland voters approved issue 2024, a proposed now elected amendment that would dramatically, dr drastically change how the city's policing department operates and put final decision on policing policies, policies and, dis and discipline of officers in the hands of a civilian led board and commission. This body would now have power instead of an advisory. Um, Director Howard, I would like to start, start with you on how do you you think that issue 24 is going to change or have effect on, on community engagement when it comes to the consent decree? So uh, keep in mind with the, um, the gains that have been made in the consent decree, um, the things that we have on the table with, with regard to community engagement, um, and I can talk about some of that stuff more pointedly, is that I think that what, what we're going to see is we're going to see a continuation of what we have been doing. Um, we, I believe that we'll probably see some input um and uh and, and, and greater involvement from the cpc but with the path that we're on and the things that we're doing i see us um, continuing on and possibly having some advancement uh in that and, and more dialogue great thank you and then um kareem how do you feel that it's going to change so um you know i'm glad to hear uh public safety director carrie howard say what he just or hear what he just said um it's a different tone than what I've heard previously, but I will say this, that the big difference that you're gonna see is that um, there's, I think that it's gonna be the death of favoritism that exists within the disciplinary process. You know, it doesn't matter who you know politically, um, the amount of clout that you have and so forth, but if you want, if your actions warrant some type of discipline, that it will be fair and equitable discipline, and it won't be able to be overridden by the chief or the public safety director. And, and Victor, I wanted to get your input on this on, on issue 24 as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think what I'll just add is I think that um, this is an example of community engagement. Um, and, you know, the community came together and uh, supported and pushed an effort. And um, I do feel optimistic that with, um, you know, the work that's been done at the police department and with uh, the incoming mayor, that I do think this is going to be a very positive um, effort moving forward. Hey, Danielle, if I, if I may, because mm -hmm. I, I, I answered the question with regard to community engagement, um, thinking about, in my mind, I was thinking about community engagement between you know, uniform members of the division of police and, and the community, but to touch on discipline, um, over the time that I've been safety director since June 19 last year, um, it, it has not mattered who anyone knew or um, I've oper we, we have operated on, on fairness and, and transparency, providing in-depth decisions that show support for the disciplinary actions that have, that have been made. So that fairness, um, and then this, the disciplinary process that folks have seen coming out of the uh, Department of Public Safety is going to, you know, I see that remaining consistent. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, you know, also last week, Justin Bibb um, became mayor elect after 16 years of having Mayor Frank Jackson um, as mayor. Um, you know, and also Police Chief Williams, Calvin Williams, also said that he's going to be stepping down. Um, in January, um, you know, which a lot of people are already expected. But, you know, now that we will have um, a new mayor and a new police chief, um, you know, and I'll throw this out to the panel, you know, how do you think this is going to um, change, affect, um, you know, anything when it comes to, to having the consent decree to have, you know, basically, you know, what some might call, you know, new blood in these um, positions? Um, I'll go with uh, <laughs> Victor, I'll go with you first. How, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I do, uh, I've been listening to, you know, just the, during the campaign, just the, the dialogues and the conversations. And I, I do think that we're going to enter an era where there's going to be, you know, a lot of bridges are going to be uh, built and a lot of um, efforts that at times may have been working against each other. I do think that uh, uh, under this administration, there's going to be uh, just a lot of that coming together. So I feel really optimistic. And also, you know, um, I think Justin's going to carry on the work that our current 
mayor, the passion and commitment to Cleveland. So I, I think it's going to be uh, very positive for all of us. And um, and I think you're starting to hear, I think Kareem mentioned earlier that he was very uh, optimistic about some of the words that were being used and the change in language. So I, I'm very, I feel very optimistic, as I've said. Yeah. Great. Kareem? Uh, yes. Um, well, firstly, I wanted to say, I hope that every time I say something, you're not going to give a public safety director or law enforcement an opportunity to rebut what I say, because that's been a common theme that's been happening. So they get a lot of opportunities to speak and it becomes their show. But I, um, so please, I hope you guys take uh, handle that. But what I wanted to say was um, I'm optimistic under this administration because this is an administration that's not going to be, or at least doesn't give the appearance that they will be working to sabotage the consent decree. I feel that, you know, being that the current consent decree is uh, the city's like, I believe around 37% compliant. I believe that you will see leaps and bounds from that once uh, the Bibb administration comes on and you'll find that their compliance record is going to be astronomical in comparison. They won't have some of the saboteurs in place that they currently have now. So I'm very excited. Great. And Drew, I just want to say it is a conversation. I'm not, so if the police I mean, want to. Fine. I hope I have the opportunity then to speak on. Otherwise, you're going to be giving, it's going to be very lopsided. And so I just hope that that doesn't occur like it has in the past. You're, you're more than welcome to also to speak. You know, it's a conversation. So I just want to. You, it's not, if you want to speak up, you're more than welcome. So please, please speak up as much as you would like, okay? Um, but when it comes to Mayor-elect Bibb, you know, he has, um, you know, talked about and during his campaigns that he wants to reset the conversation by reaching out to citizens and all stakeholders, including the police union in his efforts to recruit and rethink how police um, are deployed and bring up more foot patrols back into the neighborhood. Um, you know, when it comes, I'll start with, um, you know, Director Howard, um, you know, when it comes to this and, you know, and I know that you know, you guys will get your marching orders with the new um, chief and the new mayor. But, you know, when you hear, um, you know, the new mayor speaking about things that to bring back things like foot patrols or, you know, things like that, you know, what is that? How does that make you guys feel on, you know, what you guys have been doing? So the discussions that we've had over the last year um, have been focused on, you know, heavily focused on community engagement, community interaction. Um, you know, we were stifled by the, the pandemic. Um, even changing our car plan and interacting with, with folks and, and, and dealing with that. But um, we're looking forward to having officers who are going to engage with citizens more. And there's a way, there's a way to roll it out. We have to keep in mind that we are in, in unique times and we have to operate in a, in a, uh, with a sense of safety, both for the citizen and for the, and for the officer. Um, but I'll give an example of, of our uh, expected increase in community engagement is that one of the complaints that we get throughout the community is traffic enforcement. Um, what we've instituted and you'll see being rolled out more is we have a traffic warning courtesy notice that's going to be given out. And on that notice, and also accompanied by a business card is a QR code on the back so that citizens who interact with officers can, can do an immediate survey about their interaction with the division of, with the division of police or with, you know, with that officer. There are, so I, I bring that up to say that there are things that are going to be happening, especially as we come out of this pandemic um, and going into the winter months and then that following that, the warmer weather, where you're going to see increased community engagement as we have, um, as we've been talking about. And when it comes to, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, if I may. Um, hello, everyone. Hopefully everyone's having a terrific evening. I'm actually here with about 10 uh, youth leaders uh, from my Boys and Girls Club. So team, say what's up. Hi. Uh, so just uh, chiming back in on uh, something that was previously shared as far as what we're looking um, for in the new administration as far as it pertains to the consent decree. Um, speaking on behalf of my team, we're, we're definitely not looking for more of the same. So uh, we're looking for a new wave to be ushered in, um, more accountability, more transparency, and uh, more actualization of community voice, uh, especially as that pertains to the youth level. Um, so I have them here with me today so that they can hear from, you know, community leaders, some who are involved directly with uh, law enforcement, uh, implementing the consent decree and so forth, uh, so that they can uh, continue to educate themselves and also share their voice as well. But we are definitely looking for a new move uh, in a new direction and some new energy as it pertains to the consent decree. 
Perfect. And Michelle, I want to bring you into the conversation. You know, when it comes to, um, you know, a new administration with the consent, de consent decree, do you feel that, you know, that transparency or communication might improve or, or, or continue to improve? Yeah, and I would just echo what Earl just said, you know, about the new energy. I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of that. And, um, you know, obviously this is going to be a significant priority of the new administration. And I am sure that we'll be able to work with them on, you know, fulfilling the goals that everybody wants to see happen. And so the consent decree, you know, has been in place for going on six years. And it's been, you know, some might say a struggle or, you know, to, to get this police reform off the ground and, and compliant so that the DOJ will dismiss it. Um, you know, I just wanna point out that there was, um, the consent decree was in the news again today with um, a report from Matt Richmond at IdeaStream who was reporting that the police might have violated the consent decree because um, the Cleveland police policy on transporting people in a mental health crisis for medical treatment was changed after receiving approval from federal judge Solomon Oliver um, and may have violated the consent decree. And so Director Howard, I mean, I just wanna to talk to, you know, start with you on this and, and whoever else wants to chime in, you know, the policies are, are crafted and it takes a long time and it gets community input um, and then needs, you know, obviously their approval of the federal judge. And if this is the case, I mean, it, it's not saying it has happened, but it, there seems to be some discrepancies between the approved language and the, the, the language that was given to the police officers. I mean, how, how does something like this happen if this is the case? So the first time I heard about it was when you went during our prep session where we talked about it. I've been in meetings all day. I printed out the article. And then I also went and got a copy of the um, of the GPO, uh, GPO 5.1103. Um, and the section that the article points to as not being in there, I have it um, here in, in, in my hand and it's on page six of 12. And it says that if a nonviolent individual has the ability to seek or care volu voluntarily but needs immediate care, the officer shall determine options for emergency care and transport or arrange uh, arranged transportation of the individuals within a safe manner and appropriate facility. Um, I'm not sure if the correct one was posted. This is the one that that I have, um, but I will look. I'll, I'll look into it. But it's also important to note that um, the division of police has been involved in crisis intervention transportation um, before the diversion center has come into play for probably about 15 years. That uh, and generally what they would do is they would transport someone to St. Vincent's Charity Hospital. Um, so it's not new to the division. Um, I will look into the claims of the um, of the article on IdeaStream um, and get the correct GPO uh, posted. Uh, but I, I'm not aware of, of any requests that have come across my desk for a comment on it. I know the article states that a request was made to the to the um, to the division. All requests don't always make it across my desk expeditiously. But um, I would it, it it seems that if that's the case, that it's an error. The correct one will be posted. Okay, but I just want also, I mean, because it was reported out today and I know you're, you're gonna work it out, but I wanna bring it to the to the rest of the members of the panel. You know, if this is the case, you know, uh, you know, do you feel, I mean, this is a step back? I mean, because, you know, Michelle, I wanna start with you. I mean, you know, as a you know, US attorney, I mean, these, you know, policies, you know, go through a lot of layers for a reason. And, you know, if words are being left out on the implementation, then then it's almost as if it never happened, would you say? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that. And I would also say, you know, I don't think anybody's goal is to, you know, have a, a running tally of, you know, supposed violations of the consent decree. I mean, what we really all want to see happen is, um, you know, policing that works for the city of Cleveland. And, um, you know, it's my understanding that there was some thought about you know, whether that was really the best way to handle the situation and the decision was made that it was, you know, it was probably best to make a change. To the extent that this may have been a consent decree violation, and again, you know, I haven't really analyzed that either. It's, you know, it's more in the realm of a technical violation, and I don't really think anybody is interested in focusing on that. We just want to focus on getting the best policy in place. Okay, I understand. Anybody else like to add to this? Um. I guess I would chime in and say, uh, in rebuttal to that, if it was a violation, whether technical or purposely done, um, I think what just your average citizen is looking for is just a level of fairness, as Kareem hinted to earlier, 
if being in violation of a, of a law, even if it were a minor infraction, would lead to, say, a ticket or a potentiality of ending up in jail, I think citizens are just looking for the same uh, form of accountability for our leadership. And I think when there are violations that are made, we're past the time of hearing that, you know, it's a oops or it's a my bad from our leadership, uh, especially after we are already dealing with so many things on a daily, uh, just even as it pertains to the pandemic. And, you know, constantly having to look at situations where the accountability is more intense on the regular citizen side and not from our leaders and our law officials and law enforcement. And no, and I definitely appreciate that. And I understand that. Um, and, you know, obviously compliance with the consent decree is an important goal. But I think here, you know, what the, the process doesn't work that, you know, we're looking for violations and, and keeping track of them. I mean, what the ultimate end game is, is to bring the city ultimately at the end of this process into compliance with the consent decree. And, you know, if something like this was a little stumble in that, in that way, um, you know, it's just, it's not going to affect the ultimate outcome, which is to, you know, get the city into compliance. Yeah, and I, and I, echo, I echo Michelle on that. Um, you know, it's important that the correct policy definitely be posted. And, and when things like this rises to our attention, we have to look at it, it has to, it has to be fixed. And then we have to put a statement out to, to the community that, that um, you know, that a mistake was made and that the correct one posted. Okay. Um, Yes, I wanted to say that we have, you know, there are policies that are in existence right now that have come down since the implementation of the consent decree. And still, even in this process of dealing with disciplines for officers, we found that the recommendations or the, rather the policies that have been put in place have, have oftentimes been cast to the side. And so I, you know, I must agree with Earl in the fact that we can't make this a little thing because this is a what they would call a slight omission, but in actuality, with things that are actually in the policy, we found that the folks that are um, are the decision makers uh, with regards to discipline have not even been necessarily uh, going by the very policies that they're supposed to be enforced, the new policies. And I don't know if Victor wants to jump in and speak to this because, you know, compliance with the consent decree is the role of the monitor. They are the, you know, the entity that evaluates that. And that's sort of an ongoing process. And I think that, you know, the, the head monitor, Hassan Aden, has, has talked about in the last few weeks that it is sort of transitioning into the phase of you know, getting the policies into place. And now we turn to evaluation of compliance with the policies. And so, you know, the things that are being mentioned now will be evaluated. The monitor will be doing reviews and reports of the city's compliance and all of these things will be examined. Yeah, Michelle, well said. And also would like to just um, draw people's attention to our semi-annual report that comes out twice a year which goes down every paragraph of the consent decree and talks about the, the district's level of, of uh, compliance from non-compliance to operational, to general compliance. And, and just the other thing I'd like to add is, you know, I think these conversations are so important because uh, going, tying this back to community engagement, you know, I think for that to be effective, we have to have transparency um, and also we have to have accountability. And I think that that's what, uh, we're talking about here is that, you know, ensuring that the information is available to the public in a transparent way. If mistakes are made, such as the wrong GPO being placed and fixing that, but if there isn't, uh, you know, compliance with a GPO or someone's violating something, that, uh, the, that the community holds the police department accountable for that as well. So th thank you. Well, so that leads me to my next question, which was about the Cleveland Police Monitor and how you know he filed um, the report in federal court earlier this month. And he said that it would be at least late 2023 before Cleveland has met the requirements um, of the police department's consent decree. It was supposed to happen in 2022 in areas like community policing, bias-free 
policing, search and seizure, and the relationships between the police department and the community police commission. Um, the most um, of the categories that he used, you know, he, he, he rates them are partial compliance. You know, he also said that relations between the police department and the community policing commission remain in an area of concern for him. So the report, um, you know, described that the CPC um, as plagued by a lack of respectful, transparent, and productive collaboration between the city and the CPT, CPC. So Victor, you know, to, back to you. I mean, so this was not, you know, this report is saying that there are still a lot of problems, you know, six years into this, um, and into this uh, consent decree, especially when it comes to, you know, the police and, and the, the commission. Yeah, and we've been reporting that throughout, uh, as I said, you know, there's two reports that come out uh, every year. And um, yeah, in order to really uh, fulfill the consent decree, we have to see two years worth of uh, compliance in all aspects. And there are several sections, many sections that we're still, you know, we're showing, we're improving uh, in some and in other areas, we still have a lot of work to do. So as Michelle said, the next two years will really be more around auditing and ensuring that uh, the CDP is um, reaching that operational, that general compliance. Does anyone else want to add to um, or, or speak to this report? Um, I, I would say it's interesting to hear that we're that far away. I think that's a little disappointing. Um, I think for you know, parts of the policy, it may take some time to reach and hit certain goals um, and just things that are pinpointed. But for, in my opinion, like your basic human matters, you know, excessive force should be done away with immediately. You know, treating your fellow man uh, humanely and with respect, um, operating in transparency, I think those things should be done immediately. I think it's disappointing to hear those numbers still be so low, so many years in, and then obviously, you know, hearing a new date of completion be pushed back yet again is, uh, it's frustrating, and I think I speak for myself, obviously, and my, my, and my team who's here with me alongside me in the room. So um, if I could add that, you know, when we have individuals, you know, that, um, that for example, that work with the city, that say things like, you know, uh, everyone's familiar with the forced resignation of Aisha Bell Hardaway. And so when you have people like, you know, Greg White make statements like, you're too much of an advocate for the community, and um, the Community Police Commission, I don't think you should be in this role. Like, you know, wanting her to not be in that position, I mean, it's not necessarily about being an advocate for the community, but it's about being an advocate for what's right. And so when you have someone like that, that was a part of the um, memorandum that we had back in 2004, where the DOJ came in and said they wanted some changes, you know, that was failed. And you brought this same person back on, you know, to oversee this one on the city's behalf. I mean, like it's it appears to be intentional sabotage. So, of course, we're going to have the lack of progress that we're having. And if, if I may, just to bring it back to why community engagement is so important, Kareem, you're right about, you know, um, and as you know, uh, Professor Bell Hardaway is back. Uh, with the monitoring team. And, and, and a lot of that was really because of the advocacy of the community. Um, so just bringing it back to why community engagement is just so critical for any reform effort, um, especially this one. And so I just wanna make sure that we get questions for the seven o'clock when, when we hit seven o'clock. So if anyone has any questions, please make sure to text your questions to 216. 307-5632. Again, that's 216-307-5632. And so, you know, I know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, nobody is disputing that. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, community engagement, Michelle, you know, just talk about how important this work is for the community to be involved to make sure that, um, you know, that, that the city gets off of, off the consent decree and does have significant police reform when it comes to uh, policing here in, in Cleveland. Yeah, so, you know, whenever I talk about the consent decree, I always like to, to start by looking at what led up to it. You know, um, the consent decree is really designed to address 
um, what DOJ found during its 15 month long investigation of CDP. And probably the most elemental finding was that there were structural and systemic def deficiencies um, at CDP, and that included inadequate engagement with the community and a lack of trust between CDP and the community it serves. And, you know, community engagement, you know, there are some very obvious and tangible ways that that happens, like the, you know, community police commission and the, the district policing committees. But really engaging with the community, um, you know, is, is really a key aspect of literally everything that CDP does. And it's really um, the cornerstone of pretty much everything in the consent decree. I think you could look through the consent decree and pick pretty much any provision at random, and we could figure out a way that it relates back to community engagement. And so improving the relationship between CDP and the community is really, it's a cornerstone of the consent decree. And, you know, I think that one thing that we should talk about is, um, you know, that the consent decree um, required CDP to transform its its philosophy and the way that it polices to become um, focused on community and problem oriented policing, and that is um, you know really a way to it's it's a way to empower the community to have a voice in what CDP does. It's a way to get the police to recognize that the community is a valuable resource. Um, for information and ideas on how to solve the problems in the community. And it's to get them to target their policing activities at solving problems rather than just you know, proactively and, and deciding what the problems are and figuring out ways to prevent them rather than just being reactive, which is I think what a lot of people see as the problematic policing that they don't like. Um, so one of the things was that CDP was required to develop a community and problem oriented policing policy. And that is something that we've been working a lot on recently, like including just earlier this week. And that that policy is very close to completion. And, you know, I'm sure that Commander Johnson, who's um, working really hard on that, you know, can, can talk about that. But some of the really key elements about that um, that I think that the community will appreciate hearing about are that it requires officers to um, spend 20% on average of their time doing what are considered to be community engagement activities. And you know, I will let the, the folks from CDB talk a little bit more about what that is going to involve. It also um, requires them to um, incorporate CPOP, that, that's what we call community and oriented policing, into um, most of their policies, in, you know, explicitly, including um, what we're also talking about tonight, which is hiring and recruiting. So, Commander Johnson, so you've been over this. So, just talk about a little about what are some of the things that um, the Cleveland Division of Police will be doing. You know, that, that Michelle was talking about um, to make sure that there is more community engagement with the community. Okay, so let me uh, take a few steps, a couple steps back, and talk about the CPOP plan. And the CPOP, of course, like Michelle said, is community engagement merged with problem oriented policing. So the plan itself, uh, we didn't just put that together ourselves. We got input from the community, from various communities around, around the city. I think we hit 18 different places. We also had presentations on what, and, and there was a survey done on what the community actually wanted to see in the plan. Okay. So, and the reason why I wanted to go back to that is because as we're seeing through this conversation, community engagement means a lot of things to a lot of people, and it's multi-layered. So what the CPOP plan does and what the CPOP GPO does is focuses uh, not only just on, mostly just on how officers who are assigned to patrol duty with a different, very uh, specialized unit engage with, uh, with the public, but also how it ties into recruitment, and, and, and also how it ties into our uh, deployment plan. And so before I, I talk about what, what GPO pilots are going to do and what we plan on doing with officers, we also can't underscore enough that a lot of this has a whole lot to do with our ability to recruit and onboard officers. Because what you don't want to do with community engagement is rush away from it. You want to be able to take the time that, that's needed to not only just engage, you just get uh, get to know the community and have them get to know you, but you really want to get to the root of a problem 
so that you can come up with some solutions to, uh, to help uh, fix the, the, the problem that you, you, uh, you find. And you're gonna do that with your community. So what the CPOP policy does is say, hey, this is something that you will do. You will get out of your car. You will get to know the neighborhoods that you're assigned to patrol. You will uh, spend a dedicated amount of your time engaging with the citizens and uh, finding solutions to problems. But, but again, in the 20% expectation, it's all tied into our ability to onboard officers. And the reason why I'm harping on this is because everyone on this panel has an opportunity to help us bring community members into the division and bring their voices with, it, with them, their, their, their different experiences and opinions, and so that we can truly make this a division, a community division. And so before I get to recruitment, I wanted to um, have, let Earl respond to this. Earl, you know, um, you know what Commander Johnson just said, you know, a lot of the police officers do come in contact with, um, you know, some of our youngest citizens. I mean, what do you think about the fact that um, a lot of what they're trying to do is to to just have interaction when there's not necessarily a crisis or an issue and get to know um, community members, especially our youngest ones? I think it's imperative for, you know, for law enforcement officials to be seen in the community, uh, to be seen as an individual that's safe and to be seen as someone who actually cares and isn't, you know, someone to be fearful from or an enemy, uh, just to be transparent. I think, uh, I think the fail gap is that oftentimes we hear, we hear people reference engagement um, and engagement is more than just uh, opportunity a month or an event that you have once a month or once every three months and then no one ever sees you again. It's about building a relationship in the community with the residents. And at times you hear people or entities say, well, we're in the community. So we did this event, this event, this event, this event. Uh, but if we never see you again, there's not a safe feeling from you going forward. If there's no other communication past that, then it turns into just a photo opportunity. And uh, I know with myself working with you, uh, it's always a good ploy to have youth uh, at an event to take pictures with, to post on your social media websites, things of that nature. Uh, but if they have no more interaction with you, you know, it's it's not a good feeling for them going forward. You know, they feel used. Uh, they feel as if they're being props uh, or entities to just get, you know, chairs and likes or, you know, other support. So I think for me, we're just looking for a real relationship. And uh, we welcome that. We welcome the feedback. We welcome having you around if, you know what I mean, your true intentions are to come around and be a partner. So can I add to that? Yes, sir. Okay, so Mr. Eagle, I'm so happy you said that because you're 100% right. Community engagement is more than just a one-off. It's all, it's about building relationships. It, it, it's, it's about building relationships, which will build a partnership, which leads to trust and legitimacy, right? So I wanted to talk about some of the things that we are doing. Um, we are reaching out, not only the Bureau of Community Relations, but also uh, the districts. Um, the districts are, are the district officers by way of the community engagement officers, by way of just the officers that are on patrol, and also by way of the district policing committee, which Michelle touched on, are reaching out, are reaching out to folks not at events, you know, not at coffee with a cop. That's how a lot of these things start, and that's how you oftentimes you the relationship begins. But it has to be repeated. And so that's a part of the policy. That's a part of the plan. Do exactly what you said. And, and I'm glad you mentioned it because I should have. And the other part of it that I want to talk about is the district policing committees. Now, the consent decree changed um, what was in place for decades, which was the community relations meetings, the district policing committees. The idea was to make them more functional and intentional to, to put. Uh, residents in that particular district in touch with district officers and district command to engage, build relationships, and solve problems together. And so uh, that's something else that's, you know, we've been working on. Um, and again, I, I hope this don't sound like an excuse, but I'm quite certain looking at your beautiful kids with, with their mask on. COVID significantly impacted our process uh, of uh, our progress in terms of community engagement. We, we've never been months and months <laughs> without being able to be out there with the community. So what I wanted you to know and wanted everyone else to know and to comment if they were like is 
we hear you. We understand when you say it can't just be a one-off. We wholeheartedly agree. One-offs are are are, are definitely needed, you know, um, but it can't just be that. And can I just jump in and point out that, um, you know, the kinds of things that you're talking about, Earl, you know, the kinds of, of interactions that you seem to want are actually addressed in the policy. You know, the, you know, having building ongoing relationships with the members of the community and the neighborhoods that these officers serve is actually something that is included in that 20% of their time. And from, you know, I interact with officers and go on ride alongs and, and, you know, talk to them about this. And a lot of officers actually do want to be able to spend time you know, having one-on-one -on -one close contact on an ongoing basis with people that live in their neighborhoods. But I think that previously they were concerned that that wasn't what they were expected to be doing. And what this new policy makes clear is that that absolutely is what they're expected to be doing and to be spending at least 20% of their time on. So, you know, to give you an example, I went on a ride along um, with two officers who stopped to play basketball with some kids. And you could you know, assume that they were just doing that to impress me and show off to me. But these kids knew these officers well, you know, it was clear that they do this on a regular basis. And, you know, I think the officers felt like, you know, it was really not what they were supposed to be doing, but that they wanted to do it. And now what's being clearly communi communicated in this new policy is no, that is what you're supposed to be doing. That is policing and you are going to be rewarded for doing that. So, you know, and I'm hopeful that, you know, with this new policy, a lot of officers will feel freer to develop the kinds of relationships that you're talking about. If I'm glad to hear that. I'm back. glad to hear that. Uh, Karim, if I could quickly chime in. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I would like to just quickly say, um, we're mindful that they're at work as well and that they have a job to do. So this doesn't need to be, you know, hour long sessions, two hour long sessions, but just popping by for a few minutes to say hello, give a fist bump, chop it up for a quick second if you gotta be back out we're definitely mindful of that uh, also you mentioned a ride-along program students who are in the room with me here now had an opportunity to facilitate a training uh for incoming cadets during the summer during one of the ride-along programs uh but one of the takeaways we took was that we hope that this will turn into something that is for all officers uh, especially current officers who may have been in violation of some of the things that cause us to have a consent decree and not just for the incoming group uh Karim, I'll, I'll get it back to you i'm sorry no problem. Um, I was just going to say regarding like when it comes to recruitment and community engagement, there are things internally and um, that need to happen from within inside the policing agency. So, you know, when we talk about like if I'm looking for a home and I'm in a neighborhood looking for a home, I'm going to go to the folks that I identify with as a father, as a husband. I'm going to say, how is this street? How is this school system? And so people that you know, are coming from the community that wish to perhaps become a part of law enforcement here, they're going to go to the people that they identify with. How does this treat people as a woman? How does this agency treat people as people of color and so forth? So when you have things that ha are happening internally, where law enforcement officers are not necessarily getting the support that they need from the higher ups when they see inequitable disciplines that occur, they're not going to have great things to say, you know, and then when the members and so therefore recruitment is going to be an issue. But then also when you have members of the community that experience things like what happened to a young man who was uh, at the Dave supermarket and he was accused of uh, theft. Um, you know, you had an officer who was there, you know, working under the table, didn't report it. And that officer roughed up that young man. You had people that were over him, uh, the director of public safety who wrote a scathing letter um, or wrote, made a scathing uh, notations regarding the woman who witnessed it, the mother of the child and the child itself and just glossed over the fact that a young man was slammed, slammed by this grown man. When I say young man, I'm not talking about a 13, 14, 15, 18 year old. I'm talking about a 12 year old. So when you have instances like that that happen, how much faith is the community going to have? There's a lot of work internally that needs to be done. And that's exactly why uh, we passed issue 24. And issue 24 is going to make some cultural changes within the policing agency. And we'll see some of those changes in recruitment.
Thank you, Kareem. I just wanted to, we, we have about 10 more minutes left in, in this conversation and then we'll get to the questions of the public. So I just wanted to throw out the number again. If you have any questions, 216-307-5632, text your questions there and they will be answered. Um, we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can, but they will start being answered or asked um, at seven o'clock. And so I wanted to segue um, to Detective Collier because you know we're, we're talking about recruitment and I know that you have mentioned mentioned that recruitment um, has been an issue and especially with um, COVID, but what are some of the things that the department is trying to do, especially when it comes to what Kareem was talking about, what more recruiting, you know, more minorities, you know, Hispanic, Black, Asian um, to the force so that more of the people who live in the city will see themselves in the police force. So when it comes to recruitment, we do a lot of different things um, within the city of Cleveland. Um, we work a lot with all the uh, city council members um, to talk to them and see about the different things that they're holding their events, get them to put the word out there that the uh, city of Cleveland is hiring police officers. Um, we also work with a bunch of diff different organizations in the city. We're, like we contact all of the Cleveland CDCs. We work with uh, different organizations like uh, EYEJ, e EYEJ, which is uh, headed by Maya Moore. And that deals with a lot of young people. So we try to do a lot of different things. Uh, we recruited the HBCU colleges here in the state of Ohio. So we go down to Central State and Wilberforce, um, go down there and we talk to those students as well. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we've been doing. COVID has um, stopped us from getting out in the community as much as we did. I mean, prior to, to COVID, we probably averaged over 200 some events per year and different things and functions that we went to and even hosted our own. Um, since COVID, that number has probably been down. Actually, just this year, we probably just broke over 100 different events again. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we go out. Um, we also try to increase our imprint on social media because uh, right now, a lot of people get their information from social media. Uh, we work with the Hispanic Police Officer Association. So they attend a lot of different events. Um, they help recruit a lot of the Hispanic officers that we do get to apply. We work with the, the Black Shield organization here the, with the city of Cleveland as well. And so um, when you look at our application numbers, especially our last like four or five applications, our minority numbers have actually been over 50%. Um, and that you know, includes uh, Black officers, Hispanic officers, Asians, and everything like that. Um, so when you talk about minorities, I think we do a great job in recruiting minorities to come out and take that. Even though the numbers overall may be lower, the numbers of minorities are actually up in the front for applications. And so I just hope to have to ask, I know you said you go to a lot of different universities, but have you reached out to the high schools and like CMSD or the Boys and Girls Clubs, you know, trying to introduce the career at, at a younger age for, for yes. potential uh, applicants? Actually, just uh, this uh, past week, I was at Jar Marshall. Um, like I said, prior to COVID, we went to a lot of the high schools. We go to the uh, elementary schools. Um, a lot of schools call us and ask us to uh, introduce, especially at the high schools and ask us to introduce public safety careers to some of the high school students who maybe aren't thinking about going to college and they're looking for other opportunities. Um, so we go there and we talk to the high school students as well. Um, we also work with an organization uh, called Junior Achievement. They bring a lot of different schools down to uh, public hall down to the city of Cleveland. And we talk to a lot of younger kids there, introduce them to public safety careers there. So we're starting, I've gone to talk to kindergarten students. Um, and we start talking to them as early as we possibly can to start introducing them to these careers. And the hope is that as we keep talking to them as they progress through school, from kindergarten through high school, we'll be able to, you know, get some of those kids to apply to the department as well. And Danielle, if you, um, we, we, we just crossed a milestone with South High School making it out of one committee. Um, hopefully it'll be passed within the next two weeks where we're going to open up a, uh, opening up a public safety training central academy at the old South High School. And we're partnering with CMSD there to do a vocational program um, to begin a pipeline from high school into public safety, um, filling that, that gap between high school and public safety with the cadet program um, that will allow us to be more present in the community and, and, and increase engagement with the community. Well, that sounds good. Um, and Earl, I mean, when you when you're working with um, your students at the Boys and Girls Club, I mean, do are any of your students interested in becoming law enforcement? I know it's, you know, some might have a perceived notion of what it is. I mean, what are some of your students today? What do they say when, when you talk about law enforcement as a career? Um, it, it's been something that's popped up with a few students from time to time. Um, some students are inspired by having an opportunity to become a member of the police force and help make a change. 
At, at other times, they become leery because they see uh, what they feel, in their words, uh, a lack of accountability from officer to officer, and officers stepping up and sharing a voice to their, their colleagues, uh, doing things that are unbecoming of a police officer. I would say for ones who have thought about it in the past, they're kind of on the fence. I mean, Michelle, would you say, you know, if, if a student or a young person is, is feeling this way, or Victor, either one, or, or Kareem, whoever wants to answer this, you know, that's the whole point of the consent decree and, and police reform is to change the culture so that young people will feel more compelled to be a part of the police department. Um, and because they will have that, that, you know, everything in place so that it doesn't seem, you know, so it's on the up and up. Would you say, Michelle or Victor or Earl, if you want to chime in again? Yeah, I, I, I go ahead, go Michelle. Ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I think it's it's understandable that you know some kids would not be attracted to you know serve in a police department that they don't feel um, reflects their values and you know that doesn't treat their community with respect. And so, hopefully, you know, as progress is made toward fulfilling the goals of the consent decree that will start to change but i understand you know i think it's it's very understandable that that's going to be a process yeah uh, michelle I, I agree with you and you know i go back to the early days of the consent decree when uh, the monitoring team uh, facilitated focus groups um, and that included uh, groups that represented every uh, district, as well as some um, specific groups, one of which was youth. And I just remember very clearly uh, still being in those back rooms listening. And uh, when they were interviewing the youth and they asked them, would you ever consider being a police officer? And just the overwhelming response that absolutely not. And because of these issues of of your lack of trust and what they've seen. And that's why I think this community engagement um, is so important. And when you when you read the consent decree, uh, section three, the full title of that is community engagement and building trust. And I think this is really critical. And that's why this these officer outreaches are so important with young people, because not only are you building relationships, but you're also helping to create your future pipeline and your future uh, police officers. Great. And I just do want to jump really quickly and say, and I'm sorry if I cut you off, Earl, but, um, you know, one thing for young people to think about is you can wait for you know the police force and, and police practices to change or you can step in and try to become part of the change because you know um unless and until the ranks of the police force more closely reflect the community it's it's going to be a slower process to you know get them into alignment with the community's values can i jump in one more time Sure, I think Kareem wanted to say something first and then we'll we'll let you jump in. And okay, Kareem? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, one of the things that and that that aspect of uh what Michelle just brought up, you know, just trying to um like are you just gonna watch? And so that's part of what the community did. We saw that there's a problem changing the existing culture. There's too much support for the old ways of doing things, the, the old biases and so forth. And so therefore that's why we had, you know, issue 24 uh, be placed on the ballot and it, you know, passed unanimously. And so, you know, that's a part of it. And I believe that, I honestly believe that a compliment to that is going to be um, officer, young people who um, will join the ranks uh, with the desire of being a part of the change, as well as, officers that are already in the ranks because the bad apples are going to have to make some changes or they're going to have to go. But there are going to be those that are in there that have been waiting for this. And those officers are going to be the, the officers, the veterans who are training these new officers coming in and these old officers that are, you know, all about accountability and want equity and discipline. These officers are going to be you know, the ones that are going to help usher in. Oh, did he freeze? Is Thanks that so. me? Did he freeze? Okay. Well, we'll wait for him to come back, but um, Commander, were you the one that wanted to, to say something as well? Yes, I know we're running short, so I'll be brief. I just wanted to touch upon uh, uh, three programs that we've been running long before the consent decree about youth. We have a law enforcement explorer program that takes youth from 14 to 20. 
Uh, we've actually created, we, we, we updated our uh, academy for them. It's now 20 weeks. We actually teach them what we do, how we do it, and all of that. They actually compete against other explorers. And while the academy is only 20 weeks, we, we continue to interact with them until they turn 21. Uh, we also have uh, a program at Camp Forge. Now, again, before COVID, uh, Parks and Recs would bring in 100 students per week, and we'd have candid conversations about anything that they want. And it, and it typically turned into these tough issues. And uh, we, and that's something that we continue to do after COVID, but of course, not as many kids. And of course, uh, the Explorer program is, is going to be about recruiting, you know, the, the, in the engagement with the, the, the other the, the camp, camp forward is going to be about recruiting. So there are things that we are already doing in place. Uh, so I don't want us to end on an area that no kids want, want to be because that's just, it's got somewhat of an over-exaggeration. And then we have to be supportive of young people who want to be police officers. Like, if, you know, if, well, while we're out there marketing our application period, which we are now constantly accepting applications, we are enrolling the application period, that when young people want to aspire to become police officers, we do need to encourage them to do so. And that's what's going to help to tear down that, that perceived wall between being a police officer in the community. Because police officers, we need to get it out that police officers in our community, right? They are citizens. We need to change the mindset of the division of the police and of the community so that they can come together on, on what's in common. You get out to the Boys and Girls Club, partner with CMSD, reach out to young people who want to be law enforcement officers and encourage them to do so. And, and maybe we can tone down, you know, um, you know, the visceral rhetoric that that feeds the animosity and start talking about about more positivity. Thank you for that, um, Kareem. You kind of, you you froze up, so I want to give you a chance to finish your your statement before we go to community questions. Um, um, do you do you want to finish what you were saying before you froze up? Uh, yeah, I'm, and I apologize. Um, okay. yeah, I, I, I was just gonna just you know just add that. You know, it's just really about having some, um, you know, folks feeling supported, knowing that they have some accountability um, in place. I think that, uh, you know, we're just going to, you know, bring you know, just a change in culture and just, you know, and then I will add and close, you know, with that, you know, oftentimes it's very easy to say, you know what, we need to stop with certain language or stop talking about certain things, which is, kind of what we see going on with the battles within school systems now, you know, um, they, you know, a lack of acknowledgement of, you know, the past and complicity in the current situation. And I think that the way that, you know, we get past certain things is ownership, taking onus. Um, and, and when you take onus, then, you know, like an addict, you can move forward and actually heal and get better. And that's just something that we don't see very much of when it comes to the ranks of uh, law enforcement, particularly here in Cleveland. Yeah, and Daniel, I, I agree. We can't ignore the history of policing. We can't ignore what it once was. We have to, we have to you know, acknowledge it and acknowledge that changes have to be made. Um, and that has to come from the people in uniform and the people who do make decisions. And while we do that, um, we have to ask the community to be open to accept that there is change happening and that there is change coming um, and to recognize it uh, because it, 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 it's going to take both sides of us to, uh, to come together. And I, and I know sometimes, you know, you, you hear people say, why are you asking the community to do anything? It's not the community. You have to ask that because you have to ask the community to say, you know, this, you, you had a, 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 a way that the police operated that was not good for the community, that was harmful, disruptive, and lives were lost in the way that it operated. We're working towards it operating differently, right? So we have to ask the, that, that the accomplishments be acknowledged, that, that, it, that it's acknowledged that change is happening. And again, we need people from, and I'll, and I'll just say this locally, we need people from the city of Cleveland to apply to become police officers because they understand the city. Uh, we, we, we echoed that numerous times and we need people to encourage young folks that you know you should be a police officer. There are changes happening. We, you know, we encourage you to be part of the change. Perfect. Well, I want to thank the panel for answering my questions. Um, my time is up. It is now time for those who are watching this broadcast to 
have their questions answered. And so I'm going to bring in Alicia, who's going to ask the questions. Oh, wait, hold on, Alicia, before we do, I'm going to actually start with the two youngest members um, who, are, who are watching. Um, so I wanted to start with um, Caleb and Ryan and wanted to see um, about what, 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 what's on their mind tonight. So do you want to, um, do you want to start with uh, Errol, Earl? Do you want to start with Caleb or Ryan? Uh, we're gonna go with Caleb first. Okay. Go Caleb first. <laughs> well, hello, Caleb. Hey, Caleb. Hello. Before you ask your question, just tell us you know, how, how old you are and what school you go to. I'm 13 and I go to the intergenerational school. Great, and what is your question for the panel? Um, my question is, this is more directed to the officers, by the way. We feel that officers who have been doing their job correctly shouldn't have a problem with, with issue 24 being put into practice to welcome more community involvement. What are your thoughts as someone who works in law enforcement? So we'll start with um, Director Howard or Commander okay. or Detective. Can you repeat the question one more time, sorry. Okay, yeah. We feel that officers who have been doing their job correctly shouldn't have a problem with issue 24 and being put into practice and should welcome more community involvement. What are your thoughts as someone who works in law enforcement? Um, so for me personally, I don't have um, you know, an issue with um, any of that. Um, I've been working with the community the whole time I've been here. I've, I've always been out there. Even when I was on patrol, um, I always stopped at, you know, there was a group of kids I always talked to in the area that I worked in, the businesses, all that stuff. So none of that stuff is new to me. Um, being part of recruitment now, I'm constantly out um, in the community, constantly talking to people, I'm constantly in the schools, talking to children, things like that. So to me, it's, it's, it's no big deal. And I, I mean, it's just doing what I'm doing already. Well, so in terms of issue 24, I don't think that we should get into the practice of telling people what, how they should feel, which is kind of sort of what you're saying. Officers can disagree or agree to disagree. They can, officer can feel what they want to feel. What it comes down to is, do officers follow written policy and, and, and follow the directions that they're given, not only from uh, the division, but from the input from the community? So issue 24 is passed. Um, there may be some legal challenges to issue 24. Um, my personal beliefs about issue 24 is that we don't know what this issue is going to do or what kind of impact it's going to have. So to I can't, and, and this is just me personally, how, how I feel and how I look at things. I try not to predict something that I can't possibly know. This is new. It's about more than just the police department when you really read what's in it. You know, it, it, it's as a citizen of the city of Cleveland, uh, there's some uh, language in there that I'm very concerned about. And that's not as an officer, this is as a citizen of the city of Cleveland. But as an officer, we're going to do whatever the courts uh, uh, require us to do. Our personal opinions are irrelevant. And I can tell you that, you know, I've spoken and interacted with many officers across all the all five districts and the different um, units within the division of police. And most officers, uh, and I haven't talked to all of them, so that's why I say most, they want to engage in the community. Um, they, they want to get out in touch and concern um, the people that they, that they are out there serving. They want to balance that with, do, with doing their jobs. And um, I'm a military guy. I'm not, I've, I've never been a police officer. Um, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I'm an officer in the Air Force. And one of the things that, that goes towards good order and discipline is having that solid command structure, right? And these, these officers, they understand, as Commander Johnson said, they have to follow policies, they have to follow procedures. Now, what's even better is, is if you have that officer who is excited about what is required by policy and procedure. Officers want to go into the rec centers, they want to go into schools, and they want to um, do these stops. Um, again, you know, and I hate to keep bringing up COVID, but COVID really complicated the plan that when I came on uh, and I discussed with Chief Williams and the command staff about what, what we've been what we've been wanting to do um, so the community hasn't been able to see that right because of that and as we come on the other side of it we hope that the uh that the community sees more and and, and is willing and excited as well about interacting with police officers again i go back to that we got to tear down this wall that divides community and police and realize that we are all you know 
we all make up Cleveland, right? We all make up one Cleveland and we, and we have to interact like that. And now to a greater extent, it's the same way with our neighbors. We, when I was young, we, we interact with our neighbors way more than we do today. So there's a, there's a societal distrust and we have, and, and, and that distrust has to be resolved. And it's very important, it's extremely important that that, that, that distrust is, is, is dissolved um, between the division of police who serves the community and the community that the division of police serves. Great, thank you. Ryan is up next. Hi. Hi, Hi tell us how old you are and what school you go to, and then your question. I'm, I'm 13 and I also attend the intergenerational school. Um, me and my group, we feel that most methods of community engagement never actually include youth voice or perspective and are mostly, and are mostly staged photo opportunities for adults. What are ways you would suggest to help change this issue going forward? Great question. So if I, if I may, and then I'll, 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 I'll put it to Commander Johnson, is, is um, we want, we're, we're, you're going to see us in the recreation centers. You're going to see us in the boys club. Or come talk, to, come talk to our officers. But also look for opportunities to get involved, like the in in in, in uh, programs like the Explorers program. Um, working with CMSD um, when we start this vocational program, um, our responsibility to the youth is to reach out to the youth and to give them opportunities to come and interact with us. The Explorers program is. A, I wish every high school student. Um, every young person would come through the Explorers program. I think they would learn a whole lot about the, about the city itself and about the division of police. Great. So I want to yeah, add, so, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. No, it's I'm fine. Sure anybody else that wants to? Go ahead, Commander. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to do exactly what you suggested. We, we need to get more youth involved. We need to listen to you um, more often to get your voices on how we kind of interact in what we're doing. We do it. Um, we don't do it on the scale that we would like. Um, being a part of not only the Explorers program is a, is a, is a good way to do it, but also uh, Mr. Ingram, them, uh, Mr. Ingram, invite us out to your boys and girls club. You know, there, we, we know that there's more than one. And, you know, I can go down a long list of, of the youth interactions that not only the your community relations have done, but also the community engagement officers in the districts have done. But at the end of the day, we didn't come talk to you, right? And so that's what we need to change. And the purpose of the CPOP philosophy, the GPO uh, policy is to go to where you are, to where you're most comfortable and where you are more, more likely is gonna ask us the tough questions that we need to answer for you. So, I would also just suggest really quickly that kids tell the police what they would like. You know, I'll bet the police would like to hear your ideas and what kinds of interactions you would like to be having from the police. So you can reach out to them too. It can go the other way. So, um, is there anybody else? Yes, I want to add one thing to this. What's really, really important um, is that we have to, we've got to go back to something that we had back when I was in school, and that is civics. Uh, which teaches about, you know, the political process and gets people civically engaged um, in school. And so in doing this, what happens is you'll have, you know, generations of children that or young people that are going to be civically engaged. And what happens is that um, they then become a conscious potential voting block. When they're recognized as a voting block as a potential group that can shift votes, they will be treated with respect. That's pretty much how it works around the city. When you look at the city where people are treated the best, it's where uh, they vote the most and where there are more property owners and things of that nature. So when young people start to be engaged more so politically, you're definitely going to see a, a big shift in the paradigm. Great. Well, thank you. I want to get to some more questions because we're almost running out of time. So um, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, Alicia, do you have any questions for us? Yes, we have a couple questions coming in from the community. One thus far, um, what are the factors that have prevented further progress from occurring over the last six years? And then will these be addressed in an urgent manner? Okay, so. Yeah. Sure. Michelle, do you want to go first? You've been, there, you've been on this longer than I have. 
<laughs> yeah, so I think that um, one of the main factors is that this has been a really significant transformative change process. Um, I think maybe more than, um, you know, was realized going into it. Um, you know, so many of the fundamental policies that guide the way CDP polices have been significantly rewritten. And it's not just a matter of rewriting the policies, it's a matter of training the officers on the policies and figuring out ways to evaluate whether they are um, you know, absorbing these new policies and putting them into practice. Um, you know, I think there's also been, you know, a little bit of resistance to some of the changes that have, um, you know, been set forth in the consent decree. Um, I think that that's changing and I'm optimistic that with, the, you know, the new administration that will change even more. But this has just been a tremendous, tremendous amount of work to get to even where we are. And I, I, and I don't think Michelle would disagree with what I'm about to say. I mean, this is we're steering a pretty large ship, um, you know, and it takes a lot of effort um, while you're, you're, you're steering it and rebuilding it, right? And it takes a lot of effort. We've had a significant amount of people who, um, who are part of the division of police now that all they know is the consent decree. All they know is the reform, the training, the accountability, um, the technology. Um, all they know is that, they, that the world has been changing around them. Um, a lot of the officers who were here at the time that the consent decree started and just before um, have retired um, or, or have moved on. Um, it, is a, it is a very new um, division of police with the amount of young folks that we have, and we have a lot of you know, reforming to do. But again, you know, there, have, there have been gains made. Um, and again, I, I can't stress enough, and I, I keep going back to it, is that the changes that have to be made have to be uh, recognized by the community and say, you know, if, and, and, and say that, you know, you aren't, you aren't the division of police that you were at the beginning of the consent decree. And we, we have to do a better job of sharing um, and communicating with the community the gains that have been made. The 10th monitor report came out and there's things that are now in, in um, general compliance and operational compliance that hadn't been uh, before. And that, that needs to be shared with the community. So we, you know, we really hope that folks um, citizens get more engaged, um, look at those reports, uh, and we have to do a better job. And I want to apologize to the young people. If we haven't been coming to you um, before, you're going to see a lot more of us now. And we hope um, that we are invited to the Boys and Girls Clubs around the city and the recreation centers. We'll get out to those as well so that we can, we can come out to you because the change in the change, the recognized change in tone and tenor comes from how we interact with young people and the adults who are in, in the city, we ask for them to, you know, re recognize some of some of their tones as well, because that that can also be uh, prohibitive to us bringing on the young people who we so desperately need to help continue to steer the ship. Great, Alicia. I would say I would like to jump in for a quick sec. I, I appreciate that sentiment. I would like to say too, uh, from a community standpoint, speaking for my team, we also don't want to be told how long we need to hurt. So the same way you want to be acknowledged for the positive work that's being done, which I can agree with, we also don't want to be told how long we should hurt. One of their classmates just was involved in an incident, not with CPD, but another police department where multiple young men were assaulted, kicked off of their bikes, uh, a follow inconspicuously through multiple communities, uh, and a couple, you know, arrested and detained. So those are frustrating things that they're dealing with in real time, in addition to you know, obviously they've been following a lot of things nationally and seeing how, you know, another officer is being reprimanded for speaking out against his fellow officers in the Ronald Green case. So we understand that things like that are set back for you guys from a, from a perspective standpoint. But I think we're also looking for uh, you guys to continue to speak out amongst that, you know, within your ranks to help build that trust as well. Yeah. And Ariel, can I add something, please? Yes, uh, please. We've been here before because we've been up under... Uh, federal mandates with, with DOJ supervision. And then after the DOJ stepped off, the Cleveland Division of Police have gone back to what they were doing before the DOJ stepped in. So that level of reluctance and so forth, it comes from a place of experience. And so, you know, I just want to second what Earl is saying. It's absolutely on point. You know, we like, give us a minute to stomach this and begin to believe in this 
And then, heck, I'll be on the highest mountain singing your praises as well. But until then, let us see some consistency over a sustained amount of time. And I'm very, very sorry, Mr. Ruiz. Oh, no. and just, I'm sorry, but just a point of clarification, Victor, for one second. Um, you know, I'm not disagreeing with, um, you know, all these sentiments that are being expressed, but I do want to clarify that DOJ did not supervise the previous agreement. So this, this consent decree is the first time that there has been DOJ supervision and a monitoring team. That's okay. correct. That's you know, correct. If I, yeah, if it, I could it, add, it, excuse me. Uh, um, not, if, sorry, please go ahead. If I could add, you know, I've, I've been involved from the beginning, and I actually think there's a correlation between the speed in which the uh, we start reaching compliance and community engagement. And in the first few years of the consent decree, when people really were, you know, just starting to implement it, uh, we, had, we had challenges getting the community involved because of the reasons that have been laid out uh, that uh, Mr. Henton just laid out. But over the years, as we've seen more uh, community involvement and more community engagement, I personally have seen these conversations and some of these reform efforts speed up. So I, I just say that that the community cannot let up on this, that even after the consent decree, there still has to be engagement because all systems need accountability, external accountability. All right, let's go on to the next question. What are steps that are being made to recruit diverse candidates? Detective Collier? Uh, so to recruit diverse candidates, we do a couple of different things. Like I said earlier, um, we are out in the school system, CMSD. We work with CMSD a lot. Um, like I said, starting all, all the way down in the elementary schools and talking to the students, introducing them to the careers. Um, we also work with a lot of the different organizations here within the city of Cleveland. Um, we talk to organizations such as Global Cleveland. Um, they deal with a lot of the different uh, immigrants coming in here. So we try to get to, to them as well, talk to, so they can have people represented in the department as well. Um, we do a lot with the, um, like I said, the HPOA, who works with a lot of Hispanic different organizations here in the city. So we work with a lot of different groups to try to uh, make sure that we have the diversity we need to represent the city of Cleveland. And to, you know, to note that um, the radio has been a huge asset throughout the pandemic. And you have, we have seen a significant change um, and influx in diverse uh, applicants, men, women, um, people of color, um, not just in Division of Police, but also in Division of Fire. So what we've been doing is working. And, and now, again, coming out of COVID, um, we're hopefully we're gonna be out in the community a whole lot more. The city of Cleveland is a diverse city. Um, and I don't think anyone here would disagree that the division of police, um, all of the services, uh, the, the, the departments that offer services to the city should reflect the city. Um, and we really do need more people to apply. The difficulty sometimes can be is coming over that cultural hurdle of, of that distrust that our, that, that our community has with, the, with, with police officers. Um, and, and, and we need to encourage them that in order to overcome that, we need more diverse applicants um, so that we can have diverse hires and we can break that stigma. Great, Alicia. Yeah, kind of a follow-up question to that. And I know this was in place years ago, but do you believe that police officers should be required to live in the areas that they serve? Director. Can I address, can I address that? Yes, so, director. So some time ago, Mayor Jackson had a residency requirement that to, to, to actually to work in the city, to, to work in the city, you had to live in the city. Um, that was something this administration believed, and it was overturned and deemed unconstitutional. Um, you know, personally, I do believe that it's, it's more productive for the city to have police officers and, and other employees of the city who live in the city. Uh, if we could have it that way, I think that you would see more, more of that, but that was an effort that had been done and it was deemed unconstitutional by the courts. Alicia? Yeah, the next question here is, can the panel speak to how issue 24 can bring the police department and the community closer together and begin to create supportive relationship between the two? Okay, I'm gonna start with um, Victor and then we can go. Well, I think it certainly um, elevates the, the voice of the community and um, um, gives more power to the voice of the community. I think one of the things that, um, Mayor elect Bibb has said is that, you know, as the person who will appoint uh, members um, 
to the panel that, you know, he will bring people who care about Cleveland, who care about building bridges and care about uh, safety and uh, effective policing. So um, I, I do think that it, it, it will bring people together um, uh, now that we have more of a balance, we'll have more of a balance of power. Great. Um, I just think that um, it's it really is going to be able to uh, bring folks together, because like I said, I think that, you know, more times than not, you're going to have officers who are going to see a drastic change in culture. You know what I mean? There's going to be a cultural shift within policing and they're going to welcome it because then they can feel comfortable doing the right thing not feel an issue about it, not going to feel like they're going to be ostracized or penalized as a result of it. So it's going to be support for those officers that have issues, have complaints. Um, and, you know, they're just going to feel that support that there's going to be, you know, some recourse for them. So, you know, I'm real confident in that. And then as a result of the change in culture, the community is going to feel it in the way that they're being treated and just in how they're watching that bad apples are getting done away with, which I think is incredibly crucial because we've had many, many, many missed opportunities to get rid of some bad apples. And hopefully that's going to change now. Michelle? Yeah, I think that, you know, the result of the election is a, is a very clear expression by the community that they want their voices to be heard. And I think that's always a good thing. And it's always helpful to advance the process to focus on what the community is saying. Girl. If, if, you, if you're not doing anything wrong, you, you shouldn't have any issue with it. You don't have anything you need to change, any behaviors that you need to change. So I think uh, my, myself and my group talked about it. I mean, that's kind of our sentiment. This is would be a help to what Kareem said for officers who have been looking to try to shine a light on some of the negative behaviors but haven't had the support. This will empower them. This will help uh, officers be able to hear from the community, which I think can alleviate uh, a sense of classism to a degree um, and making them not feel for some who unfairly feel like they may be above the law because they're officer. Um, this will kind of put things back on the even playing field. And like I said, if you haven't been doing any of those negative practices, you have nothing to change. You can keep policing as usual. Director. So I'm, I'm going to be, I'm hopeful that, um, that the right result comes out. I know that we have uh, officers who want to do the best they can for the community. And uh, that's what, that's what many, most of these officers have been doing. Uh, over the last year, uh, we've terminated more than a dozen police officers. Um, we've, we've, we've kind of disciplined on, on more than 30 officers. Uh, so the accountability piece is there. Um, we all, I'm, I'm also hopeful that the community is gonna be receptive of officers um, as they get back out in the, into the community um, under the plan that we've been looking to institute for some for some time, uh, so I'm I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be very hopeful, um, and I would add, you know I, again uh, you have to hold everyone responsible. The division the police officers have a much greater responsibility, absolutely, to do good in the community and do and take care of that community engagement, but our community also has. Um, some responsibility. And, I, and I'm, I'm not telling people uh, how long they should hurt or when they should heal. I've been personally touched by some of the things that have happened, happened in the media. And that's, that's, that's part of the reason why I've dedicated my career to um, reform. Um, but it has to, it, 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 you, you can't speak with a forked tongue. You can't say rejoice in the loss of life of a good officer um, and then talk about you want community um, collaboration with, with, with police. So we have to be careful with what we say. Well, Director Howard, um, Detective Collier, Kareem Hinton, Michelle Heyer, Earl Ingram, Victor Reese, um, Commander Johnson, and also Ryan and Caleb, I wanna thank you so much for your time and your insight on this very important topic of the consent decree when it comes to the Cleveland Division of Police. Um, that is our time, we are out of time, but the conversation will continue. So I do wanna thank you for your time. And I would now like to hand it over to Helen Forbes Field who will have closing remarks, Helen. Thank you, Dariel, for moderating this evening's discussion. And thanks to our sponsors, Cuyahoga Community College and Rockwell Automation, as well as our many community partners for their support in bringing 
the support and conversation to life. We also want to thank the Cleveland City Club, WOVU 95.9 FM, WOIO Cleveland 19 News, Ideal Stream, and WKYC Studios, who live stream tonight's conversation. Ideal Stream will also air a replay of the conversation next week on the Sound of Ideas. Tonight's conversation concludes our 11 part series in a journey of community dialogue. This journey was to present facts, opinions, and emotions on a very important topic for the future of our community. In this series, we've heard from government and police officials, community leaders and advocates, families who have lost loved ones, and of course, you, the public. Each of our voices matter, and each of our experiences make up the community in which we live. And at United Way and also the NAACP, we endeavor to enrich our community so that we all can thrive. Lastly, we thank each one of our session moderators, our panel participants and community members for joining us on this mission to create a voice to encourage engagement as well as advance understanding of the Cleveland Consent Decree and of each other. Thank you once again, and please have a wonderful evening. Good night.